uh, two days after we've entered the fall, and uh, since it's just the two of us, and we're not that close together, but it's like it's just talking you and, and me. Um, we're going to talk about the fall equinox, or the autumnal equinox, and, and that's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, what's going on when this occurs? Well, and it was Tuesday, wasn't it? At about 9.30 in the morning, the vertical rays of the sun were on the equator. Now, that doesn't maybe mean a whole lot to you or to me, except it's the change of seasons, because it has something to do with the amount of daylight versus darkness. And we, we have another equinox, you know, there are two in a year. The first one was in March, the spring or vernal equinox, vertical rays of the sun right on the equator. And then after that, they were moving north of the equator, and they've been there. The vertical rays of the sun have been north of the equator, which means more daylight, which means higher temperatures. That's our summer. And it's been moving back toward the equator and 9.30 on Tuesday, it was the fall or autumnal um, equinox. Today, it's two days after that, right? So we're farther south of the equator and that's going to continue. And when you get farther south, you have shorter amounts of daylight versus darkness. Usually the temperatures are cooler, <clears throat> but it's really funny. The, uh, the equinoxes remind us that uh, that nature is uh, able to sort of flip-flop a little bit. Can't make up her mind. My grandmother believed we had two seasons in South Carolina, the hot one, which she didn't like, <clears throat> the cold one, which she didn't like. And I asked her once, how can you live in South Carolina for this long? Hating, you know, or frustrated by the heat or the cold. She said she lived for the edges, and this is one of those edge times, which is a lot of fun. And plants and animals are sensitive to that. Uh, there's a tingle in the air. I've, I've been feeling it. I bet you have, too. Cooler temperatures in the morning. And that affects other animals and, um, and plants. And we want to talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, there's an urgency this time of year. It's, at the equinox, there's an urgency. In the spring, things are getting back to going. Things are starting over. Plants are budding and growing. In the fall, this is usually what we consider harvest time, right? Because life is ebbing away or slowing down. Some animals won't make it through the uh, winter that's, that's coming. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, harvest time, you think plants. So let's start with plants because really, you know this, if it wasn't for green plants, we wouldn't be here talking to each other. They're the ones that produce the food and provide the oxygen that animals need to survive. We cannot make our own food, but plants are doing that all the time. With the magic, I guess you could say, of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll plus what? Energy from a star 93 million miles away. Carbon dioxide, water, put them together. You've got a simple sugar and you've got oxygen produced. And these producers provide life for consumers, the animals and the plants without chlorophyll. And then of course death's a part of life, so this is the time of year when you talk about that. And when something dies, it gets recycled. We talk about this all the time. I was in the woods just yesterday and stumbled across all sorts of interesting things which I wouldn't have had on Tuesday to show you. So since we we're talking you know, personally one-on-one -on -one here, uh, I just wanted to show you what I found because it's really neat. This time of year, I said, was harvest time. And I don't know about you, but uh, persimmon pudding, persimmon pie, look at the persimmon fruit right there, stuck to the branch. You see the leaves now are going away, and they've been chewed on. It looks like this one has by some beetle or caterpillar. But there is the fruit on persimmon, and I've seen a lot of that this year. Now, I don't whether you know whether you remember, but persimmon trees are dioecious. You remember that word? Di meaning two, eecious meaning households. It takes two households to reproduce. There are male flowers on one persimmon tree and female flowers on a totally different tree. And what kinds of flowers were on this tree? Well, that's fruit. Fruit's a ripened ovary. So this had female 
flowers. Male persimmon trees never bear fruit. And of course, fruit is food, a food source for lots and lots of animals. And it's interesting, these connections in the natural world. Um, you know, you study the world of nature, you want to know what is it and how does it fit into the rest of the world? What feeds on persimmons? My grandmother made a great persimmon pudding and persimmon pie, which was uh, a strange and wonderful taste for me. Um, I don't know how to say it other than this way. It's, it was almost an erotic taste to me. Uh, we won't dwell on that, but that's what a persimmon looks like. You want to get it when it's, when it's ripe. But what animals climb the tree to get them? Um, opossums go up the trees? Yes, they do, and everybody would expect that, and a raccoon goes up a tree. I've seen gray foxes, and gray foxes can climb trees pretty easily and shake the branches and then drop down on the ground and recycle it. They digest the soft stuff. What happens to those brown seed? They go through an acid bath and out the other end of the animal, and so they transfer seed without thinking about it for the plant. Plus, the acid bath scarifies the seed coat and allows it to germinate more quickly. Isn't that amazing? Connections in the natural world. And, and persimmons, this is the season for persimmons. Um, I've got a little something that I picked up right outside of McKissick Museum. And this also is a plant, this may be a cultivar of the plant that we would uh, call beautyberry in South Carolina. My grandmother's generation called it French mulberry. But it actually, it, it has, can you see that? Yeah, it has the uh, clusters of fruit, purple fruit, around the axils of the leaves. And a lot of birds take advantage of this opportunity. That's free uh, food and some, some uh, water. Opposite leaves, eventually the leaves fall off and you've got quarrels of those purple, that, uh, those purple berries. My grandmother used to put these in the container every now and then just to show everybody what the fruit looks like. And without the leaves, they really pop out. Uh, food that's produced by plants this time of year is usually referred to as mast, M-A-S-T. Mast means breast. It's food that keeps animals alive. And this is soft mast that we just looked at. The hard mast would be acorns, which this year seem to be abundant. Hickory nuts, which this year seem to be fairly abundant. My grandmother thought that if you have heavy amounts of mast, <clears throat> that there's going to be a cold winter coming. And I keep notes. I've got a little notebook. Maybe you do the same kind of thing. And I noticed that really probably instead of telling you what's coming, it'll probably tell you what the weather was like um, when the fruit was forming. It's more about the way it was when the flowers were forming fruit than about what's coming, I think. But without this, there would be a lot of animals that would not be able to survive. It's interesting to see stuff like that. Here's, here's another fruit. It's just crazy. I think I've shown you this before, but this is the branch over here. And then this used to be where the flowers were, and this is a ripened ovary. See how long that is? Wow, and it's got brown seed inside. Indian cigar tree is one of the old names for it. Um, when I was foolish uh, as a child, I was told you cut the ends off and you light one and smoke it. It's never really, you think about it, made sense to put something that's on fire in your mouth, and I never smoked cigarettes either because of that, plus that cancer thing probably is something I don't want to have anything to do with. Catalpa is the proper name for this. Now, sometimes it's called a Catawba tree because of the tribe of Native Americans that live in South Carolina, the Catawbas. Well, this is Catalpa, C-A-T-A-L-P-A. -A. The fruit, uh, it's got seed that are blown by the wind. That's another way to transfer seed. Plants, you know, don't go running through the woods. They sit still. I guess part of the reason is they can make their own food with sunlight and carbon dioxide and water. That's all it takes. No, no need to go running through the woods looking for uh, food. Um, catalpa trees are also known for the caterpillars that get on the leaves. And this time of year, what's happening to the leaves? Well, we call it the fall. Leaves are beginning to fall off of trees. Now, here's one that the wind blew off. 
you see the green, so it still has chlorophyll in it. But right now, on most deciduous trees, there's a little thick layer of develop, building up right where the leaf attaches to the branch. And it's going to cause the flow of fluids and, and uh, sugar, energy, uh, to not get to the leaf anymore. It's going to block it, break it off. And what happens is that the chlorophyll then will not survive that. It will die. And if there's any color in the leaf already, you'll see that color. Sweet gum usually has a yellow color in the leaf. And matter of fact, it's not the only one. I'll let you figure this one out maybe for me. Let's start off with just the leaf. And you see the color here. It's mainly yellow. And my grandmother said it, it sort of shaped like the silhouette of a tulip. So she called it and this maybe is the best proper common name for it, a tulip tree. It's in the magnolia family. Big flowers like magnolia flowers would, uh, would be. Some people call this yellow poplar because of the yellow color of the leaf, um, but it's not a poplar. Um, some people call it tulip poplar. No, tulip tree is the best maybe name for it because it's in the magnolia family. And the genus name for all the poplars is Populus. And the genus name for this thing is Liriodendron. How about that? And then Tulipifera is the specific name referring to the tulip-shaped leaves and flowers. The yellow color that you see in this leaf is always there. There are carotenoids that really are masked by the chlorophyll. When the chlorophyll dies, the yellow color that was already there shines through. Isn't that interesting, the way the world works? Yeah, so I got a few more leaves just for fun. Let's see if I can get a few more out. I'm dropping a few on the floor here, but uh, that's no problem. We'll get them. The other color that jumps out in leaves every now and then is red. Now you see chlorophyll. You can see a little bit of green, can't you? And can't you see a little bit of yellow too, the carotenoids? This red is anthocyanin, and it only appears in leaves that have extra sugar as the leaf is dying. And usually these are the leaves that are in the sunlight, right? And so this is what makes maple trees and so many other trees interesting to see because they have different colors on the side facing the sun and from the side facing the back or on the sides. And those anthocyanins, if there's sugar in the leaf, you end up getting some pretty interesting colors in sweet gum and, uh, and also in, uh, in red maple. And I've got both of them here. And these anthocyanins, boy, if you ever want to, <laughs> three major lobes, you know, would be a red maple. The stem is red, too. Um, if you ever want to press a plant that's red like this, just, you know, with, between newspaper, put books on it, heavy weight. Um, then that red color will stay, and it's really nice. And nice reminder of a wonderful fall, which I'm hoping we're, we're all going to have. Uh, here's another green leaf for you. See if you can identify this. I'm not going to help you yet. <clears throat> have I given you enough time? Yeah, well, probably not. Let's try one other leaf from the same plant. Maybe this will help. Hmm. Look at this. These are three different leaves from the same plant. Isn't that all you need to know what this is? One has three lobes, one has two, like a mitten, and one is unlobed. And there are not many trees like that. This one is sassafras. And the colors on sassafras, oh my goodness gracious. The yellows and the oranges and the reds because of pigments, some of them are always there. The reds only come when the leaves have extra sugar. And of course, this is the larval food plant for spice blue swallowtail butterflies and, and lots of other things. I love the green, but when green starts changing, and this is one of the early leaves to change, and so they're not in good shape right now, but this is one that's called black gum. Genus name is Nyssa. It's one of the first trees to actually have red leaves, and it's pre-fall. I mean, by that, it, it comes in late summer and then lasts into uh, early fall. 
So lots of interesting plants. I got other stuff. What else have I got? Here's one that's well, there you go. This one's on the way out, but you can still see the yellow. That has to be tulip tree, right? Yeah, yeah, you would know that without too much hesitation. Now, when the leaves fall off trees, all of a sudden you start seeing things that you were not able to see before because the leaves blocked the view. And when I was a kid, skeletal material I loved. Uh, I still do. I mean, I, snakes and skeletal material is fun. Now, here's a big bone. When I was a kid, first time I saw it, I thought to myself, it's got to be dinosaur. And we have really in South Carolina very little dinosaur material that's ever been found here. But this is a, a, a bone that's light in, in weight compared to a fossilized bone and, and lighter color. And so what in the world is this? Well, it's got a ball on the end here, so it'll fit into a joint. It's got a little projection here. There's the bone here. And then look at the bottom. You're looking at the front side. Let me turn it around and show you the <clears throat> condyles on the back. So this is the back part of this bone. So this would be the left femur. I can't, well, I could stand up, but I'd be out of the picture. This is the left femur of what? What could be this big? Well, not a wild animal in South Carolina. Way too big for deer to touch. This is cow. Now, how would you tell them between a cow femur and, say, a horse? Well, this is the best one I've found. This is the one I thought was actually a dinosaur. The first time I saw it. Look how big this thing is. I'll turn it sideways. There's the the ball for the ball and socket joint, right? These are the condyles down here, right? So this is the back, and this is the front, and that's the left femur of a horse. What's the major difference? Well, size, of course, but look at this. You see that extra projection of bone? It's called a trochanter. See the way it sticks out? It wasn't on the cow. That's where extra muscles attach that allow this leg to be pulled back. And for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction, right? Sir Isaac Newton said that was true. I think it is, of course. Don't you? Of course it is. And it pales the horse forward. So skeletal material can tell you a lot about an animal, whether it's an adult or a young one, because the ends of the bone are fused together to form one solid bone. So that was an adult horse. And that was a horse, really, that was used to ride people around. We've got more skeletal material. You see one thing sticking up right behind me. But let's talk butterflies real fast. Oops, one more thing. Let me show you one skull real fast. And let me turn it around in a way. i got to get it with that back. With the, uh, it's hard to do when I'm looking at this. Look at this. Look at this. See those large canine teeth? See the ridge that's running down the middle? Can you see that? Nice ridge. Tiny space for the eyes. They're little beady eyes on this thing. But look at the canine teeth. And if you start looking at skulls, almost every animal skull you're going to find will have six incisors. Except rodents, they only have, you know, two. Rabbits on a skull have four. Two big ones, two little ones. This one has ten. And there's only one animal with that many incisors and with that large uh, couple of canine teeth. And that's the only marsupial that we've got. This is an opossum skull. And I find opossum bones pretty commonly. I've had two or three people this week who sent me emails about skeletal material they needed me to identify. And they were uh, looking at um, possum. So, uh, Colors this time of year or leaves we talked about, but what about flowers? Yellow flowers begin to dominate. Yellow butterflies begin to dominate. Uh, the goldenrod is popping right now. The gold is on the rods, uh, and I love it this time of year. That's a signal now that that uh, day length is shortening. Uh, temperatures are cooler, and it pops. And all members of the, the uh, sunflower family are popping um, right now and uh, wing stem and um, bitterweed I noticed the other day partridge pea which is one of the legumes is flowering right now with bright yellow flowers and what about butterflies in the fall of the year 
you start seeing lots of yellow butterflies. The biggest one, the one about, you know, that big, wings like that, that long, cloudless sulfur butterfly. No dark markings on the wing at all, so cloudless sulfur. These things actually migrate north for a while before they hit colder air. I guess that, in a sense, is expanding potentially the range. There's a little one about this big. It's called the little sulfur, and it has black on the edge of the wings. And then there's a clouded sulfur that's sort of in between those two. And then there's one that's more orange than yellow. It's called a sleepy orange butterfly. Supposedly it doesn't fly as rapidly as the other sulfurs. But if you've got an insect net like I've got, uh, they move pretty fast and they're hard to get netted. Now what happens to those butterflies? Well, we used to think that cloudless sulfurs laid eggs and the eggs overwintered. And that's the way the process started in the spring. We're finding that cloudless sulfur butterflies actually hibernate. And there are other butterflies that hibernate. The morning cloak butterflies hibernate through the winter, even in the north where there's lots of snow and more cold. The angle wing butterflies, uh, red admirals, uh, overwinter as adults or as a chrysalis. You know, it's interesting about butterflies and moths. They have a lot of options to get through cold weather. They're, they're some of those animals that actually have complete metamorphosis, egg, larva, pupa, adult. And really any of those four choices work for different insects and butterflies and moths um, um, among them. But some of those things actually do over winter. Now, what are the options this time of year? You can migrate away and there are a few that migrate south. And of course, monarch butterflies, you know and I know. Thank goodness there are a lot of people planting uh, milkweed uh, in their gardens, and that's great because that's the larval food plant for uh, monarch butterflies. The old, the old name, earlier name, or, or was uh, milkweed butterflies. They used to go to a couple of ridges in Mexico. Most of them do in the eastern U.S., but now they're beginning to shortstop. Even in Charleston, South Carolina, some small groups of them are spending the winter there. Climate's beginning to change a little bit. Southern species moving farther north, and maybe species up north don't have to go as far south to, uh, to make it through the winter. Hibernation, I've already talked about butterflies doing that. Um, groundhogs, you know, uh, in the upper part of the state uh, hibernate um, in South Carolina. Bears, too, if it gets cold enough. My reptile friends do a little bit of hibernating in cold weather. Um, but it's interesting, this time of year, where did I put it? Yeah, I mean, the woods are open. How about that? Look at the way it's dangling. And you can see the big opening there. This is a moth that got out alive. And this is the polyphemus moth, a big brown one that we've talked about a lot. Um, that's a widespread species. It's almost always attached to a branch. Sometimes it breaks off in the wind. but when you see an opening like that, that the moth came out there, and it's a big silk moth. Lives about two weeks as an adult. Um, not always do the moths make it. Here is a cocoon, and it's solid, so it's a polyphemus moth cocoon. But there's no big hole, and when you hold it, it's very lightweight. It's solidly built, but this moth isn't going to make it out. There's a tiny little hole too small for you to see. That's where a wasp came out. A wasp laid eggs, or one egg, into the caterpillar while it was a caterpillar. It formed the cocoon, and then the parasite in the caterpillar actually killed its host and chewed its way out. Um, what's the term for that relationship? It's not parasite-host, it's parasitoid-host relationship. It's like a parasite at first. But then it kills its host. Strange world, isn't it? This is a time when you see insects and plants that are doing strange things, producing abnormal growths of cells with a tiny little hole, and I don't think I'm going to be able to show it to you. Well, maybe if you use your imagination, right there is an exit hole on a elliptical gall that's always on goldenrod. 
There's a moth that comes out of this. Now, wait a minute. An adult moth cannot chew its way out of a gall. A gall is a tumor-like growth, tumor growth that's solid. How in the world does it get out? Well, egg, larva, pupa, adult. The moth, when it's a larva, has chewing mouth parts. So it chews an exit hole out, blocks it, goes back in and forms a pupa. And then, as my grandmother might have said, or her generation, then just sachets out as an adult moth without being able to chew its exit. <laughs> Isn't that amazing the way the world works? It's amazing. This elliptical gall on goldenrod is a moth. This round one, a ball, gall, it's called. <laughs> it's formed by a fly, and I think, yeah, there's an exit hole there, but again, it's too small to, to see. So the shape of the gall sometimes tell you what the animal is. Now, the other thing that people find every now and then, this time of year, because, again, the woods are wide open, you find birds' nests. You would never take a bird's nest during nesting season? Of course not. But, check this one out. The person who found it thought it might be a hummingbird nest. Hummingbird nests don't hang like this. See, this is hanging down. They they're straddle a branch. Uh, they don't they don't hang down like this kind of thing. So uh, what would this be? And it's of course pretty big, and uh, it's tilted up this way. See, it's just too big for a hummingbird. But when you see a hanging nest like this, that's one of the vireos. And there are two common vireos: red-eyed vireo and a white-eyed vireo. Usually, red-eyed vireos nest a little higher than white-eyed vireos, but it varies. But the nest isn't going to be reused. Probably isn't going to make it through the winter. But this is the time of year to play detective a little bit, if you like to do that kind of thing. And I'm one of those people who really, really likes to play detective. Let me just show you this other skull. I didn't find this, but this is pretty incredible. Found in the Columbia area. Boy, look at the skull, the long nose on that thing. And then, of course, the ambers. White-tailed deer. This is a large white-tailed deer. And if you count tines, these little projections, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, then you would call this an eight-point buck in our state. And white-tailed deer are common. We've managed for white-tailed deer, and how are they doing in South Carolina? Uh, they're in my backyard, probably in yours. They eat hostas and other things, beans, if you have a a group of beans in your garden, you're going to have a challenge keeping deer out if they're uh, in the neighborhood. <clears throat> What's the difference between horns and antlers? Because this, these are antlers. Antlers are grown usually only on the males. There's one exception. Uh, caribou, the domesticated form is called a reindeer. Uh, both sexes have um, antlers on that deer. But most deer, only males grow antlers. Antlers are grown and shed every year. Horns are on both sexes of animals, larger in the male usually than the female, but they're never shed. And horns have a dead skin covering on them that antlers do not. There used to be actual skin skin on this bone that forms antlers, but when you get a bulge at the base like this, that cuts off blood flow to the antler, the antler dies, and it's, uh, it's shed. And of course, what's this antler made out of? Calcium. Where do you get the calcium? From the plant material that you're eating and recycling and changing into deer. How did it get in the plant? From the soil. How did it get in the soil? From the rocks. John Muir was correct. When you try to touch one thing by itself, you find it hitched to everything in the universe. Look at this, too. The way the eye is encircled with bone. And I see no gnaw marks on this, so there are no rodents that are trying to recycle this. Rodents gnaw on bones because that is calcium, and they want to make their own skeleton out of it. And then one of the strange things about skull deer, especially, are these zigzags, that, these zigzag lines that run across that look like sutures. 
surgical sutures, and that's what we call the connections. These antlers form on the frontal bones, which are those major bones right there. And when the antlers are shed, do you see that little bit of bone that's sticking right there? The antler grows off of that. Those projections down here at the base are left on when the antler is shed. So you can tell a male whitetail deer even when the antlers have been um, shed. You take plant material, you rearrange it, and make an animal out of it. I do that all the time. Crick neck squash, green beans, yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. Now, I found something yesterday. I, I walk in the woods over the hill from my house living in Casey. And I was walking over the hill just for the fun of it and came across a really neat pile of bones. And let's see if I can get these in a position where I can show them to you without too much trouble. Just the luck of the draw, of course, when you find things like this, but uh, I, get a, I get a lot of opportunities to find stuff. I'm out, I'm looking, and my mind is sort of geared to finding things. So uh, yesterday, let me show you the skull first because that'll be the easiest thing for you to identify. Get them lined up here. It'd just take another second. There we go, or two. There we go. There we go. Show you the skull first. Ready? Turn it around this way, over it this way. Opening for the spinal cord right here. Pretty big. So what do you think? Well now look at the look where the eye is. Isn't it encircled with bone? Yeah. There's not a lot of animals that have eyes that are encircled with bone. They're all a animals that either have horns or antlers. So what do we got here? And we've got teeth for grinding plant material and that's it. Now this is missing something. This is missing that front part that you saw on the other skull a moment ago. So this is a white-tailed deer. Yeah. And what sex is it? And you don't need anything else to look at. What sex was this animal? It was a doe, a deer, a female deer, right? Yeah, how do I know that? How do I know it's not a male that shed its antlers? Because those little bony projections that we looked at a minute ago on the frontal bones, they're not there. They're not there. And matter of fact, if I'm, as I'm looking at this, the sutures are pretty well closed on this. So this was an adult female. And the front part is broken off, and I think I know what did it. I think this was a victim of coyotes. When I was growing up in Spartanburg, there were no coyotes in the state of South Carolina. Now they're all over the state. There were no armadillos here then. We've reintroduced them. And by reintroduced, I mean that during Ice Age times, the armadillo that's here today, the nine-banded armadillo, was all over the state of South Carolina. And it was extirpated from here, it died off, and now we're bringing it back. Um, but white-tailed deer. Now this is the skull. I didn't find the mandibles. Do you think I'll go back up and look for more bones? <laughs> of course, I will. This is the bone that I found right next to the skull, which fits in rather nicely, huh? So this is the bone that holds up your world. Because your world is this brain. Protect it. Take care of it. Wear an extra skull if you're, wear, if you're riding on a two-wheeled something. Just to be careful. But what would you call the first cervical vertebra if it holds up your world? I would call it the atlas, and that's, that's what this is. So that's the atlas of a white-tailed deer. The next one that you fit in is called the axis. And it's got a little projection on it. You see that little scoop? On white-tailed deer, it's really a little scooped-out area that sticks forward. And it looks kind of like a tooth. So uh, odontoid process is the name for this. Oid means looks like, and odon means tooth. 
So it's interesting. I see chew marks all over this. I see chew marks on the neck vertebra. And then the others, little vertebra, all in a row. How many vertebra in the neck of a deer? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many in the neck of a human being? Seven. How many in the neck of a giraffe? Seven. What about a mouse? Seven. I mean, there most mammals have seven cervical vertebrae. Interesting the way the world works. Thoracic vertebra, lumbar vertebra vary, but seven for all of them in uh, in most of the mammals. Um, you got to be a good observer to find feathers. They don't last a long time. Um, sometimes you find an individual feather and that's all it takes. There's a lot of brown, light brown in here. This is a feather that's been damaged on the shaft too, right there. Maybe you can see it. A little hard to see. If I was not in the way, it'd be easier, wouldn't it? There it is. <laughs> the feather's curved. That tells me it's a flight feather. The shaft of a flight feather is always toward the front. So that has to be from the right wing of what? This is a great horned owl. This is our largest owl. This is the one that um, really it's one of the few animals that actually will feed on skunks. The first time I ever found a nest of great horned owls I saw skunk bones on the ground and there was a skunky smell coming from up which is not where skunks live and that's a great horned uh, owl. This one was bumped uh, by a car. That's what caused the, uh, the damage here. Try another one. Boy, this is a this is a stiff feather. I mean, this can blow my hair. See that? This is stiff. This is the kind of feather. Pieces of this feather would be perfect on the end of an arrow to keep the arrow going in the direction. And this is very. Can you hear that? Very stiff. Pops right back. Um, it's curved, so it's a flight feather. Shaft is toward the front, so wouldn't that be left wing? Yeah, these are not political comments. Left wing, the other one was right wing, right? Yeah, interesting the way the world works. Wonderful for using on shafts of, fa of, uh, of arrows. Slice through this, it will absorb ink, and what do you do? You make quill ink pens out of this all the time. I love this. I love the way the world works. So what is this? This zebra striping on an animal that you would not expect. Most people don't expect it to be able to fly, but it can fly very well. This is wild turkey. Found all over the state. And can perch in trees, roost in trees, uh, and can fly better than most people than most people would expect. And then another feather, single feather now. Notice this one is flat. Notice the shaft is right down the middle. Let me turn it this way so you can see the shaft maybe a little better. Red, a little bit of black on the end and shaft down the middle and flat. That means a tail feather. And this is an animal that if you were an eastern gray squirrel, you'd want to really be careful of. What is this? You gotta call it a red-tailed hawk. The other day we were planning on doing this outside and we walked out to check the equipment and a red-tailed hawk actually swooped down and landed in one of the live oak trees there. It had a bright red tail like this with a little bit of black on the ends of the feathers. They're very good at recycling squirrels. And on the campus at the University of South Carolina, the squirrel population is very, very high. This one was found in someone's backyard who had a squirrel problem, they said. And, of course, this owl will be able to help them solve that problem. Eat almost all of the squirrel, but not all of it. It's 
kind of interesting the way uh, this uh, hog does business. Um, it eats the tasty stuff, including entrails, but never the stomach. And it'll leave the stomach behind. And I've seen this a number of times um, where everything is eaten but the stomach because the squirrel is feeding on things that are bitter, acorns and other stuff that really, quite frankly, I guess the red-tailed hawk doesn't want to have anything to do with. So we got a hawk feather, we got an owl feather, and we've got a turkey feather. You got to keep your eyes open and you can find all sorts of strange and unusual things out there in the woods. Now, you know I've got to talk about a snake or two. Um, and this is a season when really snakes are thinking about maybe hibernating. Uh, they do hibernate in the uh, in the fall of the of the year. This has been a year that I have really been amazed by the number of uh, copperheads that I have seen. So I want you to know what a copperhead looks like. This is a skin of a copperhead. Now my problem is that when you skin it, you cut it down the middle of the belly. So you see that's a little bit of belly scales on the top and bottom. But look at the markings. Wide, narrow, wide markings from head to tail. Dark markings, X-shaped markings maybe is one way to think about it. Saddle-shaped markings, bow tie-shaped markings. See the way the bands are wide on the side, they get narrow in the middle and wide on the other side. Copperheads are venomous snakes. They're the most common venomous snake we've got. They might bite more people than any venomous snake in the state. Uh, they're not responsible for uh, deaths, but as, uh, as my grandmother's generation would say, it may not kill you, but it'll ruin your life. <laughs> you don't ever want to be bitten by a venomous snake. So if you see a snake, you don't know what kind it is, treat it like it's venomous, which means leave it alone. Because people this year have been bitten, a number of people, by uh, copperheads. Copperheads live uh, around people. They put up with people. They feed on um, invertebrates and vertebrates. Uh, they'll take birds, bird eggs. They'll take shrews. They'll take other snakes. They'll take cicadas and actually uh, recycle them. And found throughout the state of South Carolina. They can be gray as a background color, but usually it's that, that brown color. And you can see one or two of those little bands are broken, uh, which is typical of uh, a lot of the copperheads in this neck of the woods. Now, copperheads are venomous snakes. This snake is non-venomous, and my grandmother even liked this one. She didn't care for snakes in general. She'd beat all of them to death with a long handle of hoe. But look at it. Black color and chain-like pattern on the back. So what do you think was a common name for this thing back in her day? A chain snake. It was also called a thunder snake because they would come out after thunderstorms. This is a very powerful constrictor. It's called the Eastern King Snake. And I guess king because it's a very powerful constrictor and it has an immunity to the venom of all of the pit vipers, the copperheads, the cottonmouths, the rattlesnakes. This snake can kill and eat, which means recycle, um, venomous snakes. It's a snake that, again, my uncle didn't like snakes much, but he realized that this was a friend and he left it alone. Let's talk spiders really quickly, too, because this is the time of year when spiders get as big as they're going to get. Um, they've been around all summer, but, you know, smaller ones you don't notice. When they're big and in the middle of a web, you start noticing them in this time of, of year. Um, and one of the biggest ones now that's <clears throat> covering more of our state than it used to was the, is the golden silk spider. And if you get the sunlight hitting the web just right, it looks like spun gold. And this silk is very sturdy. In the West Indies, it's used to, to make uh, fish nets. It's very, very sturdy. And it can stop a bird, even a larger bird. I've seen on two occasions chuckwills widows, which are basically like whippoorwills, a pretty big bird that flew through the web at night, <clears throat> didn't stay in the web, fell to the ground because of the weight, but still had its wings held together by that spider silk. These golden silk spiders, the females are that big. 
Males are, you know, pathetically small. And somebody sent me a great photograph of a female golden silk spider feeding on a green anole, a lizard that was caught in the web and couldn't get out. And while she was feeding, a tiny little male, which is about this big compared to that for the female, was mating with her. So I guess took her out to dinner and made it. She's going to lay eggs, right? Is she going to make it through the winter? Probably not. That's one of those things that happens. Death's part of life. It is. It really is. You, you can't have a recycling system without death being a part of life. She was taking an anole, changing it into a spider, and then she, of course, will die and be recycled into something else. The other spider that was very close to the web was one that's uh, about this big around, that space right there. It's got a round abdomen with big spines coming off of it. Um, it's called a spiny-backed orb weaver. It has radial lines running out from the center. And then it's got all of these circles of silk in the middle of the web. And the circles of silk, the orbs, are sticky silk. The radial lines are non-stick. Spider can walk on that. And then the sticky stuff, of course, grabs insects in the middle. Uh, this is a spider that really uh, doesn't get much farther north in the United States, but you can find it from here down through Mexico into, uh, into Central America. The spiny-backed orb weaver. The way I identify, even from a distance, before you get to see it, it's not that big a spider, bigger now though than it used to be, you know, earlier in the year. Uh, it has what, what I would call uh, dashes in the web. They're, they're extra thicknesses of silk in those radial lines. And so it's like a dash and a space and a dash and a space. And that's the web of the um, spiny-backed orb weaver. The other one that's here, we used to call a garden spider or a riding spider. It has zigzags right down the center of the web, going right through the orbs. It's another orb weaver. And it looks like it has writing. I've always thought this one was the spider that the writer of Charlotte's Web was, you know, thinking about. Um, of course, it probably wasn't. But anyway, it may be. This is a very common spider that we have here. And those spiders and the big ones, the ones that are large, are females. They're going to lay batches of eggs, egg sacs. And then they're not going to make it through the winter, but the egg sacs will keep those spiders alive through the winter, and nature starts again in the spring. It's just, it's just really interesting the way this system um, works, doesn't it? And we are, of course, uh, you know, a part of that um, system. And the other spider that's just neat fall of the year to look for, especially on goldenrod because it's sitting there trying to get any last meal it can get. Goldenrod flowers are open, insects come. The green lynx, it's called, spider, jumps on it like a lynx or a bobcat would. Um, sticks in fangs, squirts in venom, and then kind of slurps it up, right? That's the way spiders uh, do business. The females are the only ones left alive this time of the year, and she'll lay a little egg sac with a flattened bottom on it, and guard that egg sac until her uh, death. It's amazing the way the world works. Your life is gone, and yet that species is passed on to the next um, generation. Those kinds of things uh, are fun. Now, I'll tell you a couple of other things just to look for for fun this time of year. Fall webworm. You've probably noticed on pecans, hickories, uh, persimmon trees, uh, webs, that are spun around the leaves of the tree and caterpillars living in side of them. Those are not tent caterpillars. Tent caterpillars don't spin the, the silk around leaves. They're where branches join uh, the trunk of a tree. And they're there in the spring. Fall of the year, fall web worm. They're all over the place right now. Some people think they're giant spiders that spun the webs. These are caterpillars. Spinning silk out of their mouth. The spider spins it out of the you know, rear end of the body, spinnerets. This one spins it out of its mouth, which is kind of a crazy way of doing business, but that, you know, seems to work. 
This is the time of year to, if you happen to have American beech trees in your neighborhood, especially if you've got large numbers of them uh, sloping down toward water, beech maple forests you see a lot in South Carolina. This is the time to go into those woods and look for woolly aphids that are sucking sap out of the branches of American beech trees. And they're so numerous that they're called beech blight aphids. They're taking sap out of the tree. And there are just hundreds of them. And when you walk up on them or bump the branch, they all start wiggling their rear ends at the same time as if, 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 as if it's coordinated, which, you know, choreographed. And it looks like one big white thing rather than lots of little teeny white things. And some people have called that, I love this name, makes perfect sense, the boogie woogie aphid. This is the time to see boogie woogie aphids, one variety of woolly aphids, on beech trees specifically. Aphids produce honeydew out of two little uh, protrusions on the back. They can't protect themselves. Ants love to feed on the honeydew. So what does the ant do? It feeds on the honeydew, but it also protects the aphids from predators. That's mutualism. That's another one of those symbiotic relationships that are true in nature. Most people miss it. Sometimes there's so much honeydew, it squirts out, and we've got a dark fungus called sooty fungus that gets on any excess honeydew. And sometimes you'll see this um, black um, material that looks almost like a, a crumpled piece of paper on beech branches or sometimes beech leaves. Uh, even in the wintertime when some of the leaves are, are beginning to, to uh, shrivel. <clears throat> and that's where the sooty uh, fungus is doing its uh, work, really thread-like, like fungal threads are supposed to be. Uh, so that's a lot of connections on, on uh, American uh, beach. Uh, and then the, one other thing, and I think we've got a couple of minutes more, um, the dragonfly. There is one dragonfly right now, and I'm seeing it. I, I, I hope you're observing enough to notice. It flies over cars that are parked in parking lots, especially light-colored cars. And this animal likes to lay eggs in pools of uh, rainwater. It's called the rain pool glider. Uh, used to be called the globetrotter dragonfly because it's found on every continent that's warm enough to have dragonflies. <clears throat> but they will fly over the hood of cars. They're about that long body-wise. They're translucent, golden yellow in color. And they'll hover over the car and touch their abdomen to the top of the car. And believe it or not, sometimes actually deposit eggs there. I climbed up on the hood of a car years ago when I was with the State Museum to see if I could find any dragonfly eggs. I didn't know whose car it was, but as I was looking for it with my magnifying glass, the owner of the car came out of the building and said, what are you doing? And I turned around and for some reason they recognized me from Nature Scene and I said, I'm looking for dragonfly eggs. <laughs> and she said to me, yeah, well, I should have known. Probably some good reason to be there, so did you find any? And I did. So she could come and look through the magnifying glass and see that thing. I'll tell you, when you start looking at the natural world, especially on the cusp of a new season, when nature hadn't made her mind up yet, uh, it enriches your life. It gives you a chance to go into the woods. They always are welcoming and see what you can see. And of course, if you find something interesting, uh, email me, okay? Um, Manke, M-A-N-C-K-E, at sc edu, And uh, that'll get to me. So um, maybe I'll get a chance to talk about your own nature notes or maybe share what I find with, uh, with other folks. And if you ever find something you want to share with me, um, get in touch with me and and I'll be glad to, to meet with you and wear a mask, of course, as I was doing, you know, earlier, uh, to be safe and reasonable. Please be careful, um, be safe. But when you walk in the woods, you don't need a mask if you go alone and with family members 
and I do that a lot. One of the nice things about being um, old, older than I've ever been, um, is to have children and grandchildren that I can walk with in the uh, in the woods. Um, so you go out in this cooler weather and see what you can find, and if you want to share it, uh, manki at sc.edu. Um, please feel free to do that, okay? Appreciate you coming this time. I hope that we're going to be doing this in early December. I think we will. It'd be my real thrill if we could get back outside together, and once that can happen safely and reasonably, we're going to do it because uh, I'm as much at home out there as I would be in my office in this building, huh? Or at home. Take care. Be safe. Take a look at the natural world and share your love for it with other people. And be a good conservationist, right? Take good care of this natural world that's been left for us. Bye-bye.